In 2016, Zambians will go to the polls for the 15th time in the nation's history. That year will also mark exactly 100 years since the birth of the man who got the country high independence. Was Zambia's finest politician by a mile. One of the most political geniuses. He was uh, a very focused uh, person. Politically, he was a um, uh, principal. He was a very considerate man. As a leader, I think he was exceptional because he was not so. He understood the damage which colonialism had done, not just to our status as, as a country, Northern Odisha, but also to the mindset of a lot of the black people. <laughs> Hurry. <laughs> Today, Kenneth Kaunda basks in the glory of the accolades for Zambia's independence, while the true hero of the independence struggle lies here, forgotten by the nation that owes him so much. I'm sure some, some younger people, in school, I'm, I'm, I would guess that 14 or 15 year olds in school would look at the newspaper and say, Who, who's that, who was he? You know, outside southern province, you know. Little schoolboys, in, even in Mufalira, never mind in Dola, who was this man? Because of the big man interpretation of politics, because of 27 years of the big man Kaunda, and then some big men later, some of them being very little big men, now the original founder of the nation has, has been lost. Not, and so far as it's been remembered, it's been denigrated, in, you know, that he... That, that he fluffed and messed up and these other people had to take over and sort things out, you know. They, they have become the writers of history or the interpreters of history. So, what is the truth about Zambia's independent struggle and Nkumbula's role in it? He was the one who set us off on the road to independence. He conceptualized it, he imagined it, he thought it, and he saw it, and he gathered other men around him to, to help him do it. He was not doing it for himself. He calculated it so well that, um, you know, Zambia was more important, to, you know, to him. And the African people, the Zambians, they needed change. They needed to be independent. They, need, they needed to govern themselves. And because of that, um, he decided to do what he did, because that was his interest. His interest was not even to become the president of Zambia. No, for him, his interest was to liberate the people of Zambia. For that, I loved him more. I knew Mr. Harry Mwanga Nkumbula uh, in Livingston in the very early 50s. Uh, since my father was involved with civil service politics as president of the Northern Odisha African Civil Servants Association, uh, Mr. Nkumbula and him were very close friends. And Mr. Nkumbula used to visit our house uh, to have discussions with uh, my dad about what was happening in the liberation struggle at the time. And as a boy, I would sit on the veranda of the house where they sat to listen to some of the conversations which they, which they used to have. He was always uh, talking about the need for the people of Northern Odisha, as it was then called, to govern themselves. And that uh, it was important that people got an education because we have to prepare the people of Northern Odisha to take over responsibility for their own countries at some point. 
And he was also talking about improvements of the conditions of service for Africans, not just in the mining industry, but also in the civil service and in other uh, areas, including domestic servants. I first met uh, Harry when I was a teenager. I was going to school at uh, Kitwe Men's School in Kitwe, and he had come to uh, address an African National Congress meeting. That was in 1952, uh, one year after he had taken over as uh, president of the African National Congress. Oh, it, it was a marvelous experience. He was larger than life. As president of the African National Congress, of course, one expected uh, him to carry that kind of uh, aura. <laughs> but if he really was that big, how come the country knows so little about him? To answer that one, we had to take a drive back into the annals of history. It turned out to be an exhilarating journey. Back to a time when black men were the white man's horses and the national soccer team looked not so black. Back to a time when Zambia went by the name Northern Rhodesia. But what the majority of Zambians do not know is that there is one year in the nation's history that was probably more important even than 1964. The year that made 1964 possible. 1962, Northern Rhodesia. The colonial government has introduced a constitution that grants Africans suffrage for the first time in the nation's history. The idea of that constitution was to increase African participation in the legislative uh, uh, council. A total of 45 seats are up for grabs. These have been divided into what came to be popularly referred to as 15-15-15, meaning the 45 constituencies have been divided into three roles. There were three uh, uh, elections, actually, in one election. The upper role uh, elections, the lower role elections, and the national elections. The upper row seats were reserved exclusively for white candidates and the lower row seats were reserved exclusively for Africans. The third row, known as the national row, is open to both Africans and whites. But the national row has a special condition attached to it. Uh, the constitution said that um, whoever is going to win must have at least 20% from the one race and 10% from the other race. And there are national seats, about 15 national seats. For you to win any of those national seats, your candidate must get 10% of the votes from the other race. So no matter how many votes he got, if he didn't get 10% of the European vote, he could not have qualified to go to the Legislative Council. The system was designed to ensure that no matter what, the whites got equal representation in the Ledge Corps. Four political parties are contesting the elections. The United Federal Party, led by John Roberts. The Liberal Party, led by John Moffat. The United National Independence Party, led by Kenneth Kaunda. And the African National Congress, led by Harry Mangangumbla. If one of the two African parties wins the elections, the nation gains its independence. Otherwise, colonial rule continues. Before the elections uh, in October, uh, Mr. Nkumbula came to a working arrangement uh, with uh, John Roberts of the United Federal Party that the two parties would cooperate um, in supporting each other uh, for the uh, national constituencies and uh, that brought uh, uh, Harry and a lot of criticism. Uh, you need uh, uh, called in a shell out, <laughs> a traitor, uh, that kind of thing. But uh, that arrangement had made it possible 
for Nkumbola to secure uh, seats on the National Register. For any party to form government, it needs to win a minimum of 21 seats out of the 45 in the Legislative Council. But when the vote count is over, there is no outright winner. The United Federal Party has won every single seat in the upper row, plus one in the national row, giving it a total of 16. UNIP, Kaunda's party, has won 14 in the lower row. Nkumbla's party has seven seats, one in the lower row and six in the national row. The country faces a constitutional crisis. It is a nation without an elected government. The solution? A coalition government. Suddenly, Kumbla finds himself being courted by the UFP and UNIP. But which two parties? A coalition between UFP and either African party means no independence. And UNIP has made enemies of the United Federal Party and there are rivers of bad blood flowing in the streets all over the country between the ANC and UNIP. Before that, UNIP had pulled all the stops on their efforts to obliterate Nkumbla and his party. The two African parties hated each other more than they hated the whites. So everybody was looking for Harry Nkumbula to form a coalition government. I remember sitting with him there. I was sent by President Kenneth Kaunda to go and talk to him about the first African coalition government. The stage was set for a three-way courtship and everything hinged on Harry Mwanga Nkumbula. Whose bed does he get into? Roberts or Kaunda? Today's historical anomaly is that Kenneth Kaunda unified the disparate tribes in the nation. The history here couldn't be further from the truth. Nkumbla is the one that unified the many tribes in northern Rhodesia and gave them a sense of nationhood, as attested to by the many praise songs in various languages, contained in the colonial government's intelligence reports sent by spies from all over the country. Today, when people hear the name Harry Mwangankumbula, the image in their minds is an old man wearing a cap and toting a cigar. But in 1940, when he began the nation's drive for independence on the copper belt, Harry was little more than a boy. He was only 24 years old. He was certainly not the oldest African in the country, but the whole nation knew the name Gumbola. He ignited the people's imagination and gave them the hope of self-determination, and they loved him. Northern province, the members loved him. You know how they love charismatic leaders. And adore him they did. Songs in Wemba and other languages praising Kumbla made the core of the colonial government's intelligence reports. At that time, he was the only act in town. He had no equals. He had no rivals. And no one had yet seen the benefits of carving up the country into tribal factions. Zambia really was one nation, and there was only one leader, and that leader was not Kaunda. That was the time, and the Gunari Umoz, oneness was there, concrete, really oneness. Gunari Bebusan Kaudin Dani, Kayanin Dani, no. He was a national leader. In 1938, he joined the Colonial Government's Teaching Service Commission, Two years later, in 1940, the government posted him to Muflira in what was at the time the Western Province as headmaster of Muflira Central School, a new African school. 
Kumbula's posting to Muflira was to become an epochal move in the nation's history. It marked the start of Northern Rhodesia's march to independence. Kumbula had support. He had support uh, in, on the Copper Belt. One of his strongest bases was in Muflira. And uh, which lasted for a long time. You just entered Mufria during Harry Kumbura's days. You would find his posters all over the place. Harry Manga Kumbura read us kindly, and so forth. In 1942, he became founding secretary for the African Teachers Association of the Copper Belt, ATAC. The same year, he wrote a paper on the importance of female education. The paper outlined how girls' education was important for Africa's development. He argued that it was unacceptable that his school had 600 boys against only 40 girls. The colonial government felt he was criticizing their African education policy and was not amused. He always gave statistics about how few the girls were in our schools. He always, he always said it's really de depressing. The colonial office, through the district commissioners, provincial commissioners, and the colonial administration, they wanted schools to be administered in a particular way, where they believed that Africans must be given what was described as limited education, so that they don't gain enough knowledge to be able to challenge the status quo. Mr. Nkumbura was opposed to that uh, and he wanted the same education which he, had, he knew existed in other parts of Africa, in other parts of the world, to be the same education which should have been given to blacks and people of color in northern Odisha. And as a result of that, there were violent disagreements between him and the education officers at the time. In December 1943, he and Yamba represented the Kitwe African Society at the meeting of the Copper Belt Regional Council, where he spoke against Federation, attacked the Calabar, and defended Africans' rights to form trade unions. Uh, the role they played in raising black consciousness, making black people conscious that they didn't have to live under the conditions they were living in. Mr. Nkumbula was very articulate in, uh, in making those points. Among the delegates was Sir Stuart Gobran, who was suitably impressed by the cogency of Nkumbula's speech. This meeting marked the start of a friendship between Harry and Go Brown that would change the former's life and end in enmity five years later. Harry's relationships were doomed by his doggedness in his pursuit of the rights and freedom of the African people. He never let anything get in the way of that unitary purpose, not even his own welfare. He was a selfless man. Despite what anybody might say about Harry Kumbula, he was really out for the country and not for himself. Kumbula first began to imagine the possibility of uh, African unity and political advancement in the 1940s while he worked as a teacher on the Copper Belt, first in Mufulira and then Kitwe. He was very good on women issues too. By the way, China. Really, he was ahead of his time. He started a door to door campaign beseeching parents to send not only their sons to school, but their daughters too. You could see the man had had a serious foresight about the future of this country, that it will require young men who have gone to university, who have completed their studies and education. To him, um Education was, was very important, um, not only for women, but um, for, for everybody. Because he, he felt, uh, you know, going to school really was the best thing. Uh, because that's the only empowerment uh, that one can get. Around the same time, he wrote a letter to Mutende newspaper protesting the government's plans to unify the two Rhodesias. His letter was never published, but the government did not think they had any cause for concern. 
they moved him to Kitwe as headmaster of Wusakile Elementary School sometime between 1942 and 1943, putting him in charge of almost 2,000 pupils and 36 teachers. It was a monumental promotion for an African young man aged only 26. Harry was so grateful to the government and showed his gratitude by ramping up his political activism. He started influencing other teachers to support the views that, that he had. And then he also had uh, very strong links at the time when he was at Busakiri with the uh, trade union leaders, some, some of them like, like Katilungu, Lawrence Katilungu. Uh, and the mining sector had become a very explosive sort of sector and each time they went on strike, he would support their cause, you know, that they had done the right thing to strike for better conditions of service for people working underground and also on the surface, because he felt that you know, workers were entitled to better conditions of service. And then Harry did something that brought his prosperous teaching career to a grinding halt. He started holding meetings sometimes during working hours and so forth. He, he, he just got on authorities told every time because he wanted to discuss problems which the authorities did not allow Africans at that time to discuss. There was a growing feeling among the political activists that they needed to be more militant to convince the colonial government that they were serious about their demand for self-rule. During one meeting, Nkumbula jokingly suggested massacring whites to prove they meant business. A government spy relayed this to Lusaka where it set off alarm bells. The government labeled Harry the most dangerous man alive and decided he had to go by any means. He was seen again as a troublemaker. And they had the way of dealing with troublemakers. They were either banished, they, they lost their employment, and then they started saying that as a civil servant you are not supposed to get involved in, in, in politics. But Sir Stuart Gobron, the Legislative Council member who had been representing African interests since 1938, intervened. He suggested that the government neutralize his activism by giving him a scholarship abroad. As he was to later confide to his biographer Goodwin Mangilwa, Nkumbula felt that he owed his life to Go Brown. That is why they tossed him out of Osakiri school as, 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 as headmaster. With the scholarship secured, Sir Go Brown traveled to Kitwe to inform Nkumbula that he was going to Makerere University. But Nkumbula did not want to leave the nascent political movement that he had just started. When Go Brown insisted, he asked to think about it for a couple of weeks. By this time, Cicely and their two daughters had gone back to Mala for some time. So Go Brown was back within a few days with a replacement headmaster to pick him up. In mid-February 1946, he left for Makerere. He was amazed to find that in Uganda, Africans and whites mingled freely. He did well at Makerere, but his desire was to go to the United Kingdom to study for a law degree at the University of London. Harry returned from Makerere in 1947 and rejoined his family. The same year, Cicely gave birth to their son. They called him Biggie. To remember that we went to his house somewhere in here in Lusaka, Rhodes Park or something, and there were dogs. So that's the only memory really I have, <laughs> you know, of Sir Stuart Go Brown. Yeah. She was about two years old then. Stuart Go Brown secured him a British Council scholarship the following year and Harry left for England to pursue his dream at the University of London's Institute of Education. That's when he won a scholarship to go to London University. A year later, after obtaining the Institute of Education's professional certificate, he moved to the London School of Economics to pursue a degree in economics. 
the government should have known better than to send him to London. London was the bedrock of African political movement, a melting pot of politically aware students from all over the continent. In 1948, he himself demanded that he should be transferred from London University School of Education to the London School of Economics because it was more political. In the UK, Kumbula came under the influence of Pan-Africanism and worked closely with a person he would later learn to detest, Kamuzu Banda, future president of Malawi. It was with him that he co-authored Federation in Central Africa in 1949, a very influential and um, well-written, a sophisticated critique of pro-Federation arguments. Over a period of eight months between 1947 and 48, he taught English to English schoolboys and girls. So there's no doubt that he was, he was a brilliant man, which in a way again annoyed a lot of Europeans. Because the European didn't like an African who spoke, who spoke his mind or who, who seemed to know too much. Back home, the colonial government began pushing in earnest for the introduction of the Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland. A great opportunity beckons in Central Africa to develop the two Rhodesias and Nyasaland, not only in their interests, but in the interests of interracial partnership in Africa. Partnership is the operative word. Partnership between African and European. The whole future of Africa depends on the working out of this relationship. Here, Mr. Walensky, again. I want a federation, which I believe is the only way of establishing a partnership in Central Africa. At the time, the key preoccupation of the small elite of politically minded intellectuals Western trained intellectuals than Kumbula represented, was to oppose plans for the amalgamation of the two Rhodesias. This federation was not an idea which came from uh, the blacks, it came from the whites. They wanted uh, this federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland to, uh, to become one country, as it were, but a federal. Of state you know, uh, without consulting the black people and uh, so Mr. Nkumbula and all his other colleagues Kaunda, Kumbula, Katilongu, then the Nkomos and uh, the Ndavaningi Stores, the Robert Mugaves in southern Odisha, Dr. Hastings Banda in Nyasaland as it was called at the time, they all rose against this idea. It became a rallying point down with the Federation. That was the slogan. Harin Kumbula knew the danger of how a white minority can get hold of a country and dominate the owners of that country from South Africa, Australia, Canada. In the late 1940s, settler representatives dished amalgamation in favor of Federation federations between the two Rhodesias and Nyasaland, colonial Malawi. Their intentions had not changed. So Nkumbula, who had opposed amalgamation in the early 1940s, would naturally oppose federation from the late 1940s, by which time, incidentally, he was studying in London. I remember one of the descriptions which uh, Mr. Nkumbula used to give the Federation of Rhodesia and Yasa. He said this federation is the equivalent of a rider and a horse. The rider being the white man, the horse being the black man, transporting the rider wherever he wanted to go. In other words, they wanted to use Africans to achieve their own ends. And he fought very strongly against that. And then, in 1948, Go Brown supported the colonial government's proposals for the Federation. Kumbula saw this as betrayal by Go Brown. He was infuriated 
and sent a telegram asking for Stuart Gobron's resignation. Sir Gobron was upset. By 1949, the two had ceased all communication. He was a selfless man. In April 1949, Harry and Kamuzu Banda co-wrote and sent an anti-federal letter to the African Weekly newspaper in southern Rhodesia. Even though the paper was not published, it sent shockwaves through the northern Rhodesian government. And with all the time he was investing in political activism, his studies suffered. He flanked his intermediate exams at the London School of Economics. Normally, when that happened, the student was given the chance to rewrite his exams. The colonial government decided it was time to show him who was master. It revoked his scholarship and ordered him to return home immediately. They had just met a big blunder and they were to solely regret expediting his return. The African National Congress was, was born in 1948. It arose from an amalgamation of African welfare societies, as they were called at that time. The president was Ndikusita Riwanika, who later on became the Ritunga. That was 1948. In May 1951, he was appointed NRIAC organizing secretary. In the words of the Central African mayor, he was considered to be one of the most intelligent Africans in the country. Since coming back and joining NRAC, he had noted that the fight for independence still lacked coherence and vision. There was need to galvanize people around a stronger vision and more specific goals. To do this, he needed to wrest the presidency from Bikusita Lewanika. Lewanika was, was more uh... A welfare association. 1951, when Harry Kumbula came from London and, and attended the, 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 the Congress here in, in Kawata, he stood and, and talked and talked and talked and, and delivered a very, very, very clear case against the Federation. And he demanded black rule, not parity of representation and this and the partnership and all that type of rubbish which was going on at that time. He demanded black rule now. And quite frankly, that Kawata Welfare Hall where the conference was taking place completely just went wild with Harim Kumbula. And that's how he was elected president to take the place of Nduk Wanika, who was considered to be a liberal. But it was really Nkumbula who turned it into a mass um, political party. He was a brilliant speaker. He was up absolutely brilliant. He just held people spellbound. Kenneth Kaunda was among the delegates and he became a loyal convert. Kumbula and Kaunda finally got to know each other. They were to become very close allies before becoming bitter adversaries. When the votes were counted, Kumbula had polled 24 votes. Safeli Chileshe and Lewanika shared the remaining three. He did biggest support when he won the, 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 the election to become president of the African National Congress came from the Copper Belt. Because you don't forget he was a teacher in, 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 in Kitwe, and from there he had worked in Mufurira. His first order of business was to organize the NRAC into a proper political party. Nkumbula added significantly the adjective national, thereby making the African National Congress of Northern Rhodesia in 1952. He also changed the title of the governing committee from Executive Committee to National Executive Council. He set up regional party structures in all the provinces. Up to this time, the party had depended on unpaid volunteers. Under his leadership, set up um, a situation where a leader was appointed to mobilize for a, 
and not necessarily uh, someone that he liked or someone from his tribe. And that was when he made the biggest mistake of his political career. He appointed Kenneth Kaunda Secretary General of the party. When Nkumbula uh, became uh, leader of the African National Congress, uh, he brought in uh, uh, people like uh, uh, KK, uh, who became Secretary General, Kapwepwe and others. Nkumbula. Kumbula made Federation Congress's primary point of attack. I mean, he saw the whole thing. He'd seen the parallels with other African countries. He saw what the problem is. He saw we had to get rid of the Federation, um, become self-governing colony and, and then become independent as these other countries have done. He understood the problem. And he, and he understood how to go about it and he began to collect like-minded people uh, around him. So he was the beginning. When he came, Harin Kumbula said that we want one man, one vote, one value. And forget about education. As long as you can write, read and write, you are free to elect your own person. That was Harin Kumbula when he came there, so it is strictly completely read our demands, the, the rate of Africans' demands to a much higher level. And it, he gave us self-confidence. The prospect of federation terrified Nkumbula because it meant dominion status. Dominion status, which would come with the federation, meant that whites would flood into the country. Such an influx meant that more Africans would lose their land to white settlers. Polls were conducted around the country to determine Africans' position on the proposed federation. Most of the country voted no, except Eastern Province. To the Easterners, federation had a nice ring to it. Ziwazako Achimwene. The first meeting, Neo Sirija Federation, I could it yes, Sirija Federation. Tonight's meeting in Kwachongo, public meeting, raising and drama, or a mom be for a one, qua, 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 squire, so bring on. Tonight's a mom be eight, eight heads of cattle, mom be eight, eight at the spot, twenty fifty three. A total of one hundred chiefs came to attend Gumbla's rally. Being able to get that many traditional leaders to come to his meeting was a momentous achievement. The real significant thing about these dealings with the chiefs and so forth was really to show the colonial government that they are not in full control of this country. Because the, the, the colonial government at that time thought that they would control the African people through the chiefs. And that uh, the, the chiefs will listen to the district commissioners, the district commissioners will tell the chiefs what to do, the chiefs will interpret the, to the... And they were shocked that here was an ordinary African like Ari Mwangangumbora, having 100 chiefs at his meeting, listening to him very, very attentively. He was obviously a very clever and imaginative person because undoubtedly he was the true father of Zapia because he, he conceived Nor Northern Rhodesia as an independent Zap nation. The Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland was introduced two years after he became ANC president. Tiromba Federation Yakuza Kunari Kutava, Kunari Kumenyana, Kunari Kumenyewa, Manyumba, so Matiri, two, four, five. But the fight had not been a complete failure. Congress protest and agitation saw the inclusion of clauses to safeguard African interests in the federal constitution. Issues like land and African education were added. It was through the anti-federation campaign that Zambian nationalism came of age. 
But the Africans wanted more. Social segregation in public places continued. With Federation now a reality, Nkumbula redirected the ANC's focus to the color bar. It's very difficult for young people to imagine the color bar, or we call it segregation now, that used to be Northern Rhodesia, okay? But it really was. It was like apartheid in South Africa, to some extent. It was absolutely nasty. You, you, walk, you walk in town there, and everywhere in town you would find posters outside shops and so forth, dogs and blacks not allowed. He knew that had to go. When you had this exposure of going out of your country, you go to Makerere University, you then go to England for three years, your eyes, your outlook, is, it changes. And so you come back, especially at that time, you come back really committed, you know, to do the right thing, to get rid of all the ills of colonialism. The business sector, except for some very low level shops in, in the locations or in the rural areas, was entirely white. Uh, in fact, until as late as probably 1960, blacks were not allowed inside a European shop because in those days, shopping was completely separated. They would call it first class and second class. But um, the second class was for the blacks. That was terrible. But Kuja, Azungwa Peter, Naimbwa. But Paja Pamene Papita Azungu Paja, Azalimbapo, dogs are not allowed. In capital letters, dogs are not allowed. Dogo Yondani, a moon to an African. Which they have been pumming, say Kuja, Udinchive. Dogs are not allowed. We wouldn't dare go into a restaurant. Those restaurants were for Europeans. We would buy ice cream through a window. But when we went with him, he would walk into a restaurant. And all the Europeans would really look and say, oh my gosh, what's going to happen to him? <laughs> The ANC organized boycotts of shops and butcheries that sold merchandise to Africans through hatches in the wall. The boycotts had the desired effect. Soon, white restaurants, shop owners, and butchers found themselves with dwindling business. There weren't enough whites in the country to keep their businesses going. A very successful campaign that the ANC did in the 1950s was the boycott of the butchers because the butchers uh, only served whites inside and then they prepacked meat and uh, black people uh, would go and say I want meat you didn't have a choice they would give you a packet and sometimes it was rejects and but they would take your money and, and, and they would give you that and uh, uh, the ANC organized a boycott of the butchers and uh, they started getting afraid. That, that was the first time that the whites started getting afraid. All these struggles were during the time that Kumbula was in charge. And in fact, Kaunda became vegetarian <laughs> as a result of the um, uh, butcher boycott. Uh, until then, he, he would eat meat normally. Oh, the body finished through ANC, under Kumbura's leadership. Nishivari Wonse na Ripo as a secretary. But trouble was brewing in the ANC. There was criticism about him at the time that uh, he was a bit soft on colonialism. And that led to 
differences of opinion between him and the wing of the ANC at the time, which was led by Kenneth Kaonda, Simon Kapwepwe, Munukayo um, Mbwasipalo, Mainza Chona, Nalmino Mundia, Ruben Kamanga, to mention but a few, um, that uh, the struggle had to be pursued in a much more militant way, uh, rather than softly, softly. In January 1955, Nkumbula and Kaunda were arrested and sentenced to two months imprisonment for being in possession of prohibited publications that the colonial government deemed seditious. According to Kaunda and his colleagues, the 1958 ANC Zang split was caused by Nkumbla's waning militancy when he and Kaunda were released from prison two months later. Whereas Kaunda came out a charged man, more determined to fight for liberation with whatever means would convince the colonists, the imprisonment had the opposite effect on Nkumbula. The real split was one of militancy against conservatism. Kapwepe had returned from India and Sipalo and they were far more militant in their approach to, to politics than Nkumbula was prepared to go. In his case, I think he really became um, less militant, not only as time went on, but also uh, after he was, he spent a sh short while in prison. Yeah, the one thing he didn't want is to be taken back there. But after his uh, spell in prison, somehow he decided to mellow down. You know the uh, the radicalism that. Uh, had been associated uh, with him before he went to uh, uh, before he went to prison um, appeared to have vanished. But did Nkumbula's spell in prison really sap his zeal, or was this just the work of the Unip rumor mill? Here, my opinion diverges very sharply from that of all the commentators and historians. The ANC Zang split has commonly been regarded as the result of Nkumbula's increasing moderation, autocratic tendencies, love for the good life, and so on and so forth. Having carefully re-examined both party and personal records, many of which incidentally available at the National Archives of Zambia or at the archives of the United Nations Independence Party, I believe that this standard personalistic explanation for the split does not really hold water. At best, it covers a minute part of the story. Imprisonment obviously has a way of affecting people, but uh, from what I can remember, you know, Mr. Nkumbula's views never changed on anything. He remained very consistent in his views. He was just as outspoken as before, and uh, his views never changed. If he became a shadow of himself, uh, I must confess that I did not see that shadow. I was not privileged to see that shadow. The, the, the person I saw was the Mr. Nkumbula, Harry Mwanga Nkumbula, whom I had known all along, with certain views which continued right up to his death. That was the claim about him. But of course, that is Kaunda's explanation. How much it was that Kaunda and Kapwepwe saw they could take over the whole show and be, become the bosses in charge is another matter. In the end, uh, it may not have been his problem. The problem was that they wanted him replaced. The problem is that they found an alternative to his leadership. So they, they began to, to discredit Gumbula. You know, they, they discredited Gumbula, they called him a drunkard, a womanizer, and all kinds of things. These are banal, superficial 
explanation. Okay? The root, the profound cause of the split must be sought elsewhere at a deeper structural level. If Harry was criticized as a compromiser, he never actually compromised to the end. Kumbla's non-violence stance preceded his prison stint. There were a number of black people who were, were considered as betrayers to the African cause who had started supporting Roy Walensky you know, during the federation, the so-called Federation of Rhodesia and Yaswan, and who were siding with the British government who had ruled this country. And, and, and because of that, you know, he believed that you know, it was important to, to change the mindset of the people. And, and his view was that uh, we should be gentle in the way we approach the issue of the mindset. Uh, we should not use violence to change mindsets of individuals. We should use education as a strong weapon for changing the mindset of these people to make them realize that what they were doing was wrong and that supporting colonialism or supporting the colonialists at that time would take them nowhere. Much of the time of, of ANC and UNIP in those early days was to educate Africans to think differently, to make them realize that they were fully humans too. These whites hadn't got anything special. Um, the, uh, the, uh, of conscientization, you know, this, this was before black, the days of black empowerment in America. From the time Kumbula took over as ANC president, he intensified the fight for complete independence. He personally led several delegations to London to press the British government for independence, starting with the very first trip he made with the three chiefs, Chitimokulu, Gawawundi, and Mpezeni. By 1958, we were proposing that there, there should be black rule in this country. The majority of the people should be black in their legislative council. A faction in the party was unhappy with the way Nkumbla was running the party and dissent was growing against him. Things boiled over when Munukayongwa Spalo became openly exasperated by Nkumbla's refusal to allow Congress to use violence to fight for independence. He accused Nkumbla of wanting to, quote, wait like a dog at its master's table, end quote. Franklin Chitambala, Justin Chimba, Simon Kapwepwe, and Jonathan Chivunga backed Sipalo. To demonstrate that he would not tolerate that kind of insubordination, Nkumbla fired Sipalo. They were very ambitious. They were very strategic. They were very tactical. And part of their strategy was to move away from the ANC and, and, and get something more workable with a sharper edge. And then I think probably they were more authoritarian in the way. I mean, they wanted total control. I don't think they could tolerate opposition. They wanted to be in, in control of the whole show. As soon as they get, got going, they wanted to push the ANC out of the whole picture. Sipalo moved to Ndola where, after some hardships, managed to find a job. He then formed an underground group that over lunch plotted to depose Nkumbola. Among the plotters were Scott Awina, who was a journalist at the time, Arthur Awina, a civil servant and Scotta's brother, and Wesley Nirenda, a school teacher. By March of 1958, the group had snagged the entire ANC National Executive Council including Kumbla's stalwart lieutenant, Mungo Niliso. Kumbla's isolation was almost complete. Now all they needed was to convince Kaunda to leave. At this time, Kaunda was very loyal to Kumbula, and the group did not know how to persuade him to abandon his tutor. Kaunda had been to India and he met uh, Mahatma Gandhi and he met Nehru and the others. Uh, who were advocates of uh, uh, non-violence. Um, so he was a committed uh, uh, disciple of non-violence. So was Mr. Nkumbula. So they shared a lot in common as, uh, as leaders, uh, except that 
when Dr. Kaonda was persuaded to leave the ANC, which I must emphasize he didn't want to do, he was very reluctant to leave the ANC and to leave Hari Mwangangumbo because he had a lot of respect for Hari Mwangangumbo and he wanted to continue working with him. The plotters got their chance soon enough. On his way back from meeting the Indian Prime Minister Pandit Nehru, Kaunda's plane stopped over in Ndola. The plotters smuggled him off the plane and took him to Axon Soko's house where he spent the night and they laid their plan before him. He did not commit immediately, but the plotters were heartened to read in the following day's paper that Nkumbla did not know where Kaunda was. The last piece of the jigsaw puzzle had fallen into place. All that remained now was to spring the trap. The perfect opportunity presented itself just after one month. We didn't you know that we seemed to be together, uh, Kaunda and everybody. I was suspicious. So Nabuera Nava was Mdara and Mdara Panoti Muchive. Nishiana to Ava to Sari Naife. Veran is a chitika. Only Gangati Parichaku Purana. Two months later, things came to a boil. Ian McLeod announced a constitution who was the colonial secretary that was giving us a chance. Uh, then Roy Walensky did not like it and he protested uh, with the, to the British government. And he had many uh, conservative party friends uh, in the British parliament. So they changed it. They moved uh, MacLeod from being a colonial secretary and uh, Duncan Sons took over. And they changed it. It was completely an unacceptable constitution. The new constitution provided for a legislative council of 22 members and only eight members would be black. We said no, we wanted the majority black parliament. The ANC convened a meeting to discuss whether or not the party should participate in the upcoming elections under the Benson constitution. The party was divided and debated the matter for two days. When he saw that there was no progress being made, Kumbla made a unilateral decision. Congress would participate in the elections. He felt that by sitting in parliament, it would give him an opportunity to tell the world, tell them something that would be recorded in the Hansard for posterity, that uh, this is what he was fighting for. That was one of the reasons why he wanted to be on record, because when you're a member of parliament, especially in Legico at that time, that what you said was reported prominently, and it was a way of making his point heard. Of course, there were a lot of uh, people who didn't agree with that, um, and, and you don't expect everyone to have agreed with him, but th that is the way he saw it, and, and I think that um, his view must be respected, even if we didn't agree with it at the time. We had to respect it because that is the way he saw things. When Kumbula announced his decision, the young Turks walked out, led by the northern group. That is how they ended up breaking away in 1958 and they formed the Zambia African National Congress, ZANC, which was a more militant wing, breakaway wing from the African National Congress. It was extremely successful. And, I mean, it took over the copper belt like wildfire. You know, most of the ASC officials of the copper belt just change sides. So I said to him, now look, uh, what do you think of our, uh, these people who have broken away from this party? He said, uh, yeah, they are, they, are, they are going to fight for our, the same independence we also want to have. Leaving the ANC was a very emotional moment for some. 
Kaunda wept. He didn't want to do. He was very reluctant to leave the ANC and to leave Hari Mwangangumbo because he had a lot of respect for Hari Mwangangumbo. This is the story of the independent struggle in the eyes and words of UNEP. That is the story the majority of the nation knows today. That Nkumbula was a drunken failure who delayed the country's independence, spent all his time womanizing and lost his militancy after spending two months in prison. The question is how much of it is mere propaganda aimed at destroying Nkumbula politically? I'm sure it's more about political ambition and who wanted to rule the roost and who wanted power and who was going to be the first president because now by 58 an independent Zambia was already on the cards and who was going to be president. They started saying so many evil things, he's a drunkard, he's a, a what, what, what. They used that as a sword to destroy Uncle Harry politically. He drinks, he drinks. Nobody said they didn't drink they themselves. But I think at that time they were drinking Chibuku or Sheikh Sheikh while when Harry was drinking beer, whiskey. Moga is a woman. Sinigagan is a woman. But Romba, when Zeri Nikun and Akuti, Nichingarenge, Kuti, Vichy, get it. It was a political maneuver. I don't know what you mean by drunk. Because to me, a drunk is somebody who is an alcoholic, who can't function. But uh, if he functioned the way he did to liberate Zambia, I don't see how a normal, um, well-behaved person would go old Hari Mwanga Nkumbula, a drunk. It breaks my heart. When UNIP broke away from ANC, all sorts of things were said about him, that he was uh, too slow, he was um, uh, not a fighter, he was not a freedom fighter, and uh, he liked to socializing, going to bars to drink and mix up with whites. Now, I also confronted him with such a question. He said, now look, how do you allow these people to go on describing you that way? Now, he, he answered me in a way that I, I just smiled. He said, how will they know, how will they be known by the people without them describing me badly? They want to take the position of being admired as people who don't do what Nkumbula does. I did mention to you that it breaks my heart when you know people say he's a womanizer because I didn't view him like that. Old Harry married three times in his life, you know. His first wife, who is a, a big a Malau's mother, Malau Ompi, and, and Biggie. Then his second wife was Baldwin's mother. And his third wife was Loveness, Inosha Kaseva's mother. And you know, these women were very beautiful women. I mean, he had, you know, um, he had taste for, you know, for, <laughs> for beautiful women. So when they say he was a, you know, a womanizer, I don't know. I don't know, you know that part of it really. You know, Tawizo Sipari Bantu, Bankara Maganizo Siana Siana. For me, really, to pick that particular, um, you know, character about the old Harry, I think it's not fair. I may sound defensive because I'm, I'm a niece, but I am talking to you because I knew this man better than anybody else.
I must say that because he's my uncle. I lived under his roof and I saw what he did. He had a lot of respect for women and this is why he was very, very protective of us, you know, as, as, as daughters because he didn't want anybody to mess around with us. Even when he was married, his women, they, I think they had the best. You know, he would spoil his, you know, his, his woman and do the best for that woman. He was very loving, very loving man. My interpretation is that the split was primarily the result of the clash between two power blocks structured around ethno-linguistic criteria. Essentially, we're talking about Bemba speakers versus Bantu Botatwe. Ethnicity was not the only factor, however. For ethnic ideologies emerged out of a specific political economic context and the different ways in which distinct regions of the country had been incorporated into the colonial economy. Very roughly then, I would say that Zank and later Unit appealed to the waged workforce on the Copper Belt and its extensive ethnic hinterland. Whereas the ANC remained a party of peasant, rural-based agricultural producers in the Bantu Botatwe areas. The eventual breakdown in nationalist unity in 1958 had much more to do with the emergence of this latent clash between political ethnic projects than with uh, Nkumbula's alleged moderation and uh, love of the good life. Harry Mwanga Nkumbula contested the controversial elections and went on to win a seat in Lechko. He sat in the House for a period of two years between 1959 and 1960. During his tenure in Lechko, the colonial government floated a bill aimed at ensuring it would finish off UNIP by being able to sentence its leadership to long jail terms. I remember reading of some of the debate in the Legislative Council when he was a member of the Legislative Council. That was a part of these more accommodatory politics, you see. Calendar and UNIP said, forget all that, you know, that's just a talking shop. We're going to take our politics somewhere else. Else. We're not going to debate with the whites. They've got the power and we can't d debate with those in power. We're going to have a more equal speech with them, a more ideal speech. We can't argue with the oppressors. We're wasting their our breath. Harry Wood was a member of the Legislative Council and debated there. The bill is drastic and it has the complete support of the members of the Legislative Council. Finally, Kumbla has his chance to kill off his opposition and save the ANC. He can now be the only bull in the crowd. He takes the floor to state his position on the proposed bill. In his speech, Kumbula argues vehemently against the bill, reminding the council that clamping down on the opposition is not the solution. He was an excellent debater and he could get the better of these white members of the Legislative Council. Hmm. He had a good brain and he was a good debater and, and he could stand up to them. By the time he was done, Kumbla had divided the house. The bill never passed. I don't think I wonder who oh, wanted to debate with anybody. With the formation of Zank, the dynamics of the independent struggle changed. The new party had only one goal obliterate the ANC and its leader. The independent struggle that had, by all accounts, remained peaceful had just turned ugly. Blood would be spilled, and it would not be white blood. The, the point is, of 1958 to 1962, uh, really 
between African nations and Pomosan, we are bad, very, very violent, uh, but they are centered around creating the image of Bukhari Kumbula. The new party revved into gear, ramping up its drive for membership. They swaggered about prophesying the end of Nkumbula and his antiquated party. They were confident all blacks, and some not so black, would switch their allegiance from the old lion. The floodgates would open and the old man would find himself standing alone. To build himself for, for Kaunda to be important, for Kaunda to be recognized as the man of the moment, he had to obliterate Nkumbula's memory. He had to do everything to, to kill Nkumbula's uh, uh, image. Uh, and you see how that, that, that was done, including the establishment of the party state. It was all done to, to eclipse Nkumbula so that uh, Kaunda would be the man. And the history was rewritten by the, by the UNIP, by UNIP and Kaunda's group. But the flood never came. UNIP's certitude soon turned to head scratching. Suddenly, the breakaway freedom fighters' eyesight turned monochromatic. They could only see white, but black was the new white. At that time, the ANC, as you know, was committed to a policy of passive resistance against colonialism. And this wing felt that you know, there was need to have active resistance uh, against the colonialism. And sadly, or interestingly enough, even in UNIP, this division continued because Dr. Kaunda continued even after he left the ANC to advocate for passive resistance against colonialism until at Mulungushi it, it was decided at the rock of authority that there should be a more active resistance against colonial rule and that is how the Chachacha or the master plan was launched to wage a more militant struggle against the colonial rule. Sometimes now it's always I'm not to number. Sadly, Cha 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 largely targeted fellow Africans who did not belong to UNIP rather than the colonials. Kaunda adopted Chisokone, Chisokone as his rallying call to his supporters, using it to kick off his rallies. Violent clashes erupted everywhere between the supporters of the ANC and those of UNIP. If you go back, you find there are a lot of examples of uh, UNIP cadres going to actually provoke the, the African nation. Yes, because you are, you are ANC. When they find you in the beat you up. What I saw then, at that time, was the struggle for independence was not a struggle against the whites. It was largely, especially at that stage, a struggle between uh, UNIP and ANC for a political uh, supremacy. The most violent clashes were in the ANC enclaves like Chivolia, Kantanshi and Kankoyo townships in Muflira, Chifubu and Masala townships in Dola, Chipata in Eastern Province and Matero township in Lusaka. But Kumbura kept on saying, Sunga Nimtene, Tinaru is a Kunena with the city Funan Kond, Romba Seotu, Tizayambana, Teka Teka, and Shiki Tantausans. Anyway, 
Kuhubwa kuchuli wanzi. Mwombe hako masi utayo. Kuhubwa kuchuli wanzi. Maila kutahu ya wacho. Uh, that delayed colonial period in Zambia was marred by significant episodes of inter-party violence. A theme, in, incidentally, that the historiography hasn't done justice to. Sure, Zambia, we all know, is a peaceful country. No one denies that. But those years were tough especially if you happen to be an ANC member outside the southern and central province. I remember seeing a photograph one Friday of a corpse lying on the ground with the top of the head sliced off and the brain missing. There was nothing, nothing like that against the whites. That's where the power struggle was and it was vicious and it was bloody. Um, and it was territorial, and it was between armed cadres. Of course, that was a very sad period uh, uh, in our political history. So how did Kumbula react, despite his peaceful inclinations, on which every person who knew him tend to agree? He did very little to curb anti-unit violence among the Bantu Botato. Amidst all this bloodshed, 1962 rolled around. What happened was that uh, in, in the 1962 elections, uh, they ended inconclusively. No, no, no single political party had won a majority to form a government. As I said, UFP, John Roberts had, uh, had, had, uh, had 16, we had 14, Harin Kumbula had seven seats. Northern Rhodesia faces a serious constitutional crisis. It is a country without an elected government. The only solution is a coalition government between two parties, and the ANC has just the right number to team up with either UNIP or the UFP. At that time, it was tempting for the ANC to link up with UF, UFP. Among the negotiators, using his relationship with Harimang is the Skotawina. Everybody was looking for Harim Kumbola to form a coalition government. I don't think that uh, uh, UNIP was confident that we would form a coalition government with Mr. Kumbula because there were differences. Normally, when members of the same family split, or when the best fr friends split, you find that the bitterness becomes a lot more entrenched. It becomes more unpleasant. And, and on the basis of that, uh, the expectations in UNIP were there, but they were not that high. There were people in UNIP who didn't think that Mr. Kumbula would go with us. Uh, and form uh, a coalition government. I remember sitting with him there. I was sent by the President Kenneth Kaunda to go and talk to him about his co co uh, first African coalition government. And in walked John Roberts, uh, the leader of the Federal Party, carrying a briefcase. And uh, he said, Harry, can I see you for a moment? So Harry, Harry said, Winner, for, excuse me. So they went in and disappeared for about 45 minutes. When they came back, John Roberts left and Harry sat and he looked at me, I looked at him and he said, what are you missing? I said, I'm missing John Roberts' briefcase. Why? When he came in here, he had a briefcase, where is it? So he burst out laughing and said, come, let me show you. So he took me to the room where they were seated and he opened the briefcase and it was full of pounds sterling banknotes from the Bank of England. UFP was, the United Federal Party was also uh, still active at that time, representing mainly white interests. They started courting Harry Mwangan Kumbula to go into a, a coalition government with him to rule this country. John Roberts offered him several inducements for him to form a coalition government with the United Federal Party instead of UNIP. John Roberts offered Harin Kumbola 
to become the first black prime minister of North Rhodesia if he agreed to form a coalition with the federal party. And he would also become a leader of government business in the Legislative Council at, uh, at the same time. And then thirdly, he would be uh, allowed to pick his own cabinet from both the UFP and the ANC. In short, he really would become a de facto president of this country. That was the offer John Roberts made in addition to the briefcase and the quantities of money which John Roberts had brought. But the real striking thing is the openness with which Arun Kumbora handled this matter. A anybody else, any political leader, anyone else could never have handled me the way he handled me. Harry said, come, let me show you where the briefcase is. And that's when he opened it and then told me the full story of how the United Federal Party wanted to become the first black prime minister here in coalition with the white settlers and that he has turned them down, that he preferred to make the coalition with the United National Independence Party under, under Kenneth Kaunda, although he didn't trust us, he said. But he faced opposition and resentment from his executives and from some traditional leaders who were appalled at the idea of joining with UNEP. They threatened to leave. At that point, Kumbla strode into the hall, accompanied by Kaunda. He stood at the podium and surveyed the faces of the disgruntled delegates and posed three questions in quick succession. How many of you are in favor of African government? How many of you want an African government now? How many are behind me? Hands went up in response to each question. Upon that, Kumbula turned on his heel and strode out of the hall. The meeting was over and the coalition was on. The rest is history, albeit deliberately rewritten and forgotten. What he was doing, he was not doing it for himself. Zambia was more important to him. He said to me, my dearest son, my nephew, I know that you guys in UNIP are very bad. Some of you are very, very bad. But I would rather get into bed with you than get into bed with UFP because I am a nationalist. You can assure your colleagues that I will join hands with UNIP as bad as you guys are, because I believe that it would advance the cause of African independence. Those were some of the principles which he held very dear to himself. Nkumbula had spent all his time fighting for the uh, uh, self-determination for, for the blacks. Although it would have been uh, easy for him to go with uh, the United Federal Party, uh, he decided nevertheless that uh, he, should join, he should join forces with, uh, with KK uh, to form uh, the coalition government uh, in December 1962. And that's what he did. He so said, this is the type of bribery which white men think they can bribe me with. And I'm not for sale. This country has got to be under an African government. So, in 1962, Northern Rhodesia had an African government and became semi-independent. This paved the way for the young nation to develop its own constitution and hold fresh elections two years later to become a fully independent nation. As part of the coalition agreement, the six cabinet positions were shared equally between the ANC and UNEP. Kumbula chose to be Minister of Education. He was passionate about education. We offered him natural resources and so forth, which we thought was more respectable. But he said he was not prepared to be a minister of trees and elephants and so on. So he wanted a ministry which would, which would involve people. That's why he wanted African education. That time I was doing my standard six. One of the first things he changed was the calendar year. The academic year used to begin in July or August, somewhere there. Then you are going to finish that 
uh, class in May the following year. So they wanted it to, to be aligned to actual years so that when you begin in January, you finish in December. He did quite a good job at the Evelyn Horn College, which was one of Warren Kumbula's uh, um, his insistence that that college must begin with uh, diplomas in accountancy and so forth, not just academic. It must go into accountants, the professions, and then so forth, instead of academic subjects. He is the one who initiated the establishment of the University of Zambia. Um, uh, if you go to, if you get, try and get the history of the University of Zambia, you will find that the first move uh, about uh, establishing a university started in March 1963. At that time, he was the Minister of uh, Education. Two years later, in 1964, fresh elections were held. This time, Kaunda resoundingly defeated Nkumbla to become the now independent nation's first Republican president. Yes! <laughs> it was very exciting. The day of independence, this was in Matero. So we all had to be in Matero and watch, you know, the Union Jack come down and the Zambian flag going up. I cannot explain the feeling. It is something which you cannot tell somebody to say, this is how I felt, because it was so exciting. Happy times for the emancipated nation and the hero, Kenneth David Kaunda. Post-independence, Nkumbla's role in the politics of the nation changed. From being a freedom fighter, he assumed the role of guardian of the people's rights against Kaunda's autocracy. He was the Zambian nationalist who refused to go away. Okay. Uh, fighting a sustained battle against UNIP hegemony from the late 1950s to the inception of the one-party state in 72-73 and beyond. The second general elections loomed large on the horizon, but UNIP's position as the party was far from cemented. Something had to be done to get every Zambia to become a UNIP member. UNIP cadres started carrying out fierce card checking operations at bus stops, railway stations, hospitals, and sometimes door to door. People without UNIP cards were prevented from boarding public transport. This led Nkumbla to call for the dissolution of the UNIP youth wing. Kaunda condemned the demanding of UNIP cards in public places. And then, in August 1965, he legalized it via the Penal Code Amendment Bill. In presenting the bill to the House, Justice Minister Mr. Justin Chimba said the bill would help party organizers to do their jobs and stay within the law. The bill was passed into law with a vote of 41 against 16. Kaunda decided to speed up the unification of the country by increasing his control over the economy. Operation Mulungushi Reforms was born. Now he would be able to dangle all those parastatal jobs to entice people to join UNIP. It was the era of political patronage. Nkumbula was a careful observer of 
dynamics taking place within NeoNIP and the suspicion that the nationalization of the economy served at least in part to pacify affected or increasingly disaffected uh, leaders and members of UNIP. On 24th April in Parliament, Nkumbla condemned state-owned enterprise, charging that Kaunda's humanism was quickly evolving into communism, the end result of which would be flight of capital, followed by unemployment and general disaster. You think that those economic reforms in 1968 were ill-advised, ill-conceived? Hey Charles, I, perhaps the best way of answering that question is by telling you that um, if history had to take us back to 1968, April 1968, I would repeat that action several times over. Um, that was the, be the beginning of the forward surge, forward movement, in so far as power to the people in economic terms. Is concerned. UNIP was in the driving seat. Once they were sure they had obliterated Nkumbla, they turned their attention to divvying up the spoils of war. They turned the party it pays to belong to UNIP slogan into action. It pays to belong to UNIP was one of the, the slogans which we used during the 1964 general election. We were telling the people, you, you vote for, for you, it pays to belong to UNIP, you will get jobs much more easily, you will get uh, uh, loans from the banks much more easily if you belong to the ruling party. It was a way, uh, an interpretation of what in America they call the spoil system. The, the, in America and in other democracies, they have a system they call the spoil system. What the spoil system means is that, for example, in, in the United States of America, if a, a, a Republican president comes into office, there are so many thousands of jobs that change hands. And they bring in people who supported them during the campaigns. It is accepted as standard. But when it is done here, or it is done in other African countries, it assumes a different connotation, but this was exactly where they got it from. But I don't think it had much, much effect on on real the the, the, the running the running of of of, uh, of government. But it did. Honorable Winner was on the inside looking out, so he can be forgiven for seeing only roses. But for the people on the outside looking in, the picture was not so rosy. Occasionally it was extended, uh, even in social circles, it, it pays to belong to UNIP. Later on it became UNIP to UNIP, that n no one outside UNIP was expected to have relationships or marry into families that belong to other political parties. It, it degenerated to that extent. A lot of people not admit that, but I'm aware that it happened. I must say, this, this was actually even now very difficult for me personally. Because now I was dating a man who was uh, in UNIP, and my own uncle is uh, the main, main opposition party. And this is the late Humphrey Mulemba. But I must say, Humphrey had, uh, had a soft spot for the old man. I don't know whether it's because he loved me, he wanted to win the... <laughs> he wanted to, to, you know, to win the... <laughs> you nip to you nip. <laughs> For the people in the UNIP government and their relatives, it pays to belong to UNIP was analogous to manna from His Excellency Kenneth Kaunda. They played musical chairs with government jobs, sent their children to schools abroad on government scholarships, 
gave each other loans, awarded their second cousins jobs in parastatos. It was open season, and life was good. On 23rd December 1968, Kaunda stated that, quote, I cannot see how I can continue to pay a police officer or a civil servant who works for Nkumbula. How dare they bite the hand that feeds them? They must learn that it pays to belong to UNIP. Those who want to form a civil service of the opposition must cross the floor and get their pay from Harry Nkumbula. End quote. Kaunda further ordered Justin Chimba, then Minister of Trade, Industry and Mines, to court, ensure that none of the eight opposition MPs elected in Barot's province was granted a new license or had their old license renewed. End court. To tell you the truth, I don't think that I can give you any justification because it was a very irrational thing to do. It was difficult, it was difficult, but I could see that even a few people in UNIPI were a little bit uncomfortable because they saw that they are reaping from what old Harry worked for. In March 1967, UNIP expelled Nalumino Mundia from the party for alleged more practices concerning government loans the previous year. Expelling Mundia turned out to be a big mistake. In 1968, he joined UP and immediately became its president. The tidal wave against UNIP was rising, and Kaunda was aware. He banned UP on 14th August 1968 and incarcerated Mundia together with the party's entire leadership. Immediately upon release, Mundia and Chipanga joined the ANC. With the elections just a few months away, the stage was set for a showdown. However, UNIP was still confident of getting the results. They were fielding big names such as Munukayumbwa Spalo. In addition, they had the state machinery to carry out the campaign. But the results left UNIP hung jawed. 1968. All parliamentary seats in Western province were won by the African National Congress. You know that? In this state. All of them. That's when the big names lost power. People like Munukamba Spalo, you know, people who lost were very big names. Arthur Wiener, who was the Minister of Finance and probably uh, the best Minister of Finance that the country has had. Um, he lost the position of being the party treasurer and therefore he lost the position of being the minister of finance, you know, and municipal lost his position and all that. Uh, when all is said and done, uh, the losses were decimated and UNIP, uh, uh, which had uh, uh, control of 10 of the parliamentary seats, uh, in uh, in Barotsaland uh, in uh, 19 uh, in, from, in, from 1964 to 1968 lost them all in the 1968 election. It, it was that bad. That's when Kaunda woke up and said, "Ah, looks like one percent only way around." Kenneth Kaunda had committed himself during the election campaign in, in 1964 that Zambia will not introduce the one-party system by legislation but that it will come to the vote by the will of the people themselves. It caused him a lot of problems later on, when he wanted the one-party state now. He committed himself, and this was a very, very public statement, that Zambia is different. My people will eventually agree with me, so I will not introduce the one-party state through legislation, but through coercion and so forth. Everybody shall just become unique. In March 1972, Kaunda announced the appointment of John a chairman of the Commission of Inquiry into the establishment of the one-party state. The introduction of the one-party state uh, leading into the one-party participatory democracy in 1973 was long coming. But it is often said that uh, UNIP imposed it. Uh, 
facts speak differently. What are they? The commission went down through the country. I provided Zambia for planes. They took the commissioners throughout the country, east, west, north, south. And they brought out a report which showed clearly that people wanted a one-party participatory democracy. The decision to introduce one party was not even taken by way of a referendum. I remember the announcement which was made by President Gaonda. It said that the cabinet has decided to introduce a one-party state. And in order to make this a reality, I am therefore appointing a commission of, of the inquiry to go around, headed by Mainza Chona, the deputy will be Humphrey Mulemba, to go around and gather the views of the citizens, not on whether there should be a one-party state, but what type of one-party state they wanted to see. That is what happened. They did not ask the people of Zambia uh, whether uh, they should establish the one-party state. Uh, that decision was made by UNIP and KK. Um, and then in order to, in order to give it a, a, a sugar coating, uh, KK established uh, the, uh, the Chona uh, uh, Constitution Commission uh, to work out uh, a constitution for the establishment of the one-party state. Harry was totally opposed uh, to the whole idea. In fact, he resented it. Those were some of the issues which Mr. Nkumbula did not agree with and uh, they remain the major source of uh, contention and the major source of disagreement between Mr. Nkumbula and Dr. Kaonda. He knew Nkumbula would see the one-party state proposal for what it really was, and Kaonda knew old Harry would raise hell on this. So he tried a clever move. When Kaonda appointed a commission to investigate the one party state and propose a constitution. He appointed Nkumbula and Nalumina Mundia, who were at that time working together on that commission. But of course, they both refused. <laughs> Kaunda's choice of the commission's chairman was a masterstroke. The southern province was the biggest stumbling block to the establishment of the one party state. By appointing one of their own to lead the commission, Kaunda hoped that would make their resistance less virulent. The temptation to abandon the multi-party dispensation grew stronger as UNIP grew weaker and more internally divided. By 1972, UNIP was in, in such a weak position. Mwansaka Pepe had broken away from his national party, from UNIP carrying with him a lot of very, very powerful people, leaders from the northern province. Later on, Naomino Mundia also broke away, taking away, taking with him some very influential people from the other party. So UNIP was real in a state of disintegration. Between 1971 and 1972, moreover, the possible electoral alliance between a resurgent Congress and the newly formed UPP, Capoepo Splinter Party, terrified the unit. They were especially disturbed by Capoepo's by-election victory in Mufulira West late in 1971, where former ANC voters, Mufulira being an area of historical strength of the ANC, voted solidly for Capoepo. This was the first electoral defeat experienced by UNIP in the Copper Belt since independence, and it illustrated quite graphically that a coalition between ANC and UPP could pose a significant threat to UNIP. Mainza Jona retained a thick report 
which he handed to Kaunda with a lot of pomp and ceremony. Kaunda moved quickly, tabling the one-party state bill in parliament. Nkumbula and Mundia proceeded to file an injunction in the high court to stop the one-party state. Kumbula proposed suspending debating the bill until after the high court hearing on the petition. But Speaker of the National Assembly, Robinson Navuliato, ordered the reading to proceed. And a week later, High Court Justice Doyle threw out Nkumbula and Mundia's petition. Back in Parliament, the bill passed with the required two-thirds majority. He declared what Ian Smith, who followed Mr. Bill, Ian Smith once described the one-party state as a politician's dream. You made all, all opposition becomes illegal and then, um, and then you can rule forever. You may even believe in some cases if you have um, uh, an, enough of uh, bogus priests around you and, and the chapel of St. David or something, you may even believe that you will not only rule forever but live forever. <laughs> Kaunda was finally a legally sanctioned dictator. But he knew without Nkumbula on his side, the new law meant very little. Hari still controlled a large part of the country in southern, central, and western provinces, as well as Muflira in the Copper Belt and Kawamba in northern. As long as the ANC continued to exist, those areas may as well be sovereign states on their own. That was the, the time when Kenneth Kaunda sent me to go and call Hari Kumbola to State House to go and have a meeting with him. But before Scott Awina, Kaunda had sent two cabinet ministers, Solomon Kalulu and Axon Soko, to try and persuade Harry to the one-party state idea. That didn't work. Then Kaunda remembered Harry's close relationship with Scotta. He had used Scotta once before in the 1962 coalition dance. It was time to cock that gun once more. It was a real crisis that could have led to the paralysis of this country. The liberation struggle in, in, the, in Southern Africa was not developing well at all. And there was a, a, a lot of pressure was being put by South Africa, Portugal. It was really a crisis and we really needed the one-party state. But Kenneth Kanda could not declare a one-party state at that time because UNIP was in a, in, a, in, a, in a state of disintegration. He needed the Haring Kumbura. And that was the Haring Kumbura that morning after the Emerald, uh, when, I, when I took him there. Ken Kanda explained the crisis to, to Haring Kumbura. And Haring Kumbura said, for the sake of the nation, I'll tell all African National Congress branches now to support you, to save this nation from collapse. But Nkumbula knew he was being given the tour of a Potemkin village. The traditional interpretation then is that the inception of the one-party state was a means to contain factionalism within UNIP and to prevent the country from breaking apart, basically. That's how countless observers and political scientists have explained it. Kumbula understood it differently. Kumbula viewed it as a last-ditch resource uh, as of, a, of an increasingly fragile and discredited political class whose sole intention by this stage was to cling on to power. Darling Kumbula said, you see, I want to go, go, go to the southern provinces. This is a delicate issue. Go to, go to the southern province and meet all the chiefs first and talk to them about it because this business of supporting UNIP is a, is a very sensitive one among, among, among my Tonga people. The Tongas hated UNIP and this was not the kind of news even Kumbula could just blurt out. He told Kaunda he would need to convene a public meeting in the southern province and invite people and all the chiefs to come and participate in the discussions. It was a huge, huge, huge thing. Very, very huge thing. All the chiefs were there, all the, 
people from Namwara where they pen, 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 pen. I think they are from, they are from Wembe or some other place. Very, 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 very touching. A few, little few moments in the history of the country where you feel the nation moving in one sort of direction. On 27th June 1973, Harry Mwangangumbula signed the Joma Declaration. It wasn't easy at all. So some of the decisions Harry Mwangangumbula made, it, it was not easy. Kaunda's supporters took to the streets to celebrate his ultimate victory carrying a coffin to symbolize the death of the African National Congress. After 25 years of political activism, the African National Congress was finally dead. There was no, uh, no hope. President Kumbula did not want to shed blood in this country. He never wanted to have an open fight between ANC and UNIP. His position, he just said that he would do it in the best interest of the country, but that he personally did not think it was the right thing to do. So he had misgivings, and I remember that even when uh, the Choma Declaration was signed in the, the hall, the assembly hall of Choma Secondary School, he signed the agreement and he made it clear that uh, he had done it in, in the best interest of the country. I think... Uh... Nkumbula sucked in a lot of the ideas and ideals and belief in the procedures of British-style liberal democracy. And I don't think Kawande ever had that. To him, to Kawande, if you, the opposition was the enemy. And it became immediately apparent once he, once he became president in 94, once he was head of government, he regarded op opposition as, 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 as uh, treachery. He didn't see the difference between opposing the state, opposing the government, and undermining the state. But even after Mr. Nkumbola had agreed to the Choma Declaration after some persuasion, he always said, and he told me that point blank a number of times, that I will support this declaration, but I will not accept any position in the government. I will allow my people to accept positions, but I will not accept any position in the government. And he never did. He allowed the Mongoni Lissos and others to accept positions in government, but he never accepted any position in government. That is how principled he was. For me, if even the media, all those people really who do reporting on journalism, if they could just go back and, and research old Harry's movements from the time of um, struggle up to independence, up to Choma declaration, up, you know, even his statements that he made, you know, in the media. Um, I think really they would even question the people they interview who call him all these names. I think they would question them a little bit further because Joma declaration, if it were other people, the old man would have said, give me a position in government. But he didn't. It would have been easy for him to accept a position, even to insist that he wanted to be vice president or to be a senior minister in the government, and he would have gotten it at that time and enjoyed all the facilities that go with office, the benefits, the fringe benefits that go with office. But he did not opt for that. He said that he would not accept to be in the government and he decided not to join the government. He never joined the government. This is very telling of the type of man you are talking about. He didn't ask for any position. All what he did was, yes, one part state, but for me, I will not get any position in government. 
he did wouldn't do like some of his friends did and and to join UNIP and, and you know and go into the Central Committee and become a one-party man. He was a, essentially a multi-party man. He believed in um, a liberal um, democracy. He believed in free market economics. He didn't believe in state ownership, and he didn't believe in authoritarian government, one party, one leader. What he is sad is that until at least the appearance of my book, uh, this all-important politician had been treated with great condescension by posterity. A drunkard, a womanizer, nothing to say. All of this, and the end result of these stereotypes was to constantly keep the spotlight on Unip and Kaunda. What I've tried to do with my work is to shift the spotlight on Tunkumbula, making a case for his centrality to Zambia's political development, both before and after independence. In 1978, five years after the Joma Declaration, Nkumbula and Kapwepwe decided to challenge Kaunda for the UNIP presidency. Harry Nkumbula and, uh, in, in Simon Kapwepwe uh, changed their mind and said, now they, they want to contest that president of UNIP. They even came to Mulungushi International Conference Center where the National Convention of UNIP was, 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 uh, was taking place. And they registered themselves as presidential candidates to challenge Kenneth Kaunda. But Kaunda was not about to risk being ousted from his own party by either Kapwepwe or Nkumbola. He convened his executives under cover of night, and they changed the rules. Overnight, we, we had changed the rules. That now, in order to stand as the president of UNIP, you must have five years continuous membership of UNIP as a member, which Harry Mkumbula didn't have. Sometimes I move a little too fast in certain situations. This year it came as a result of some of my colleagues thinking that um, they could put up a candidate who would, you know, fight me in the, in the seat. But as a result of that, the United National Independence Party unit constitution had to change. Mm. That's correct. Inevitably. As happens with all dictators, after three decades at the helm, Kaunda had finally run the country into the ground. Education was a shambles. Painkillers were hard to find in health facilities, and the shop shelves were empty. People queued for days and sometimes overnight to buy millimeal, the country's staple food. All basic commodities like soap, cooking oil, sugar, bread became hard to find. Prices shot up and black marketeering became a thriving economy. For the first time, Kaunda became openly the villain and people called for his resignation. On 17th December 1990, Kaunda reluctantly acceded to the demands for the reintroduction of multi-party politics. He signed the bill that repealed the one-party state. I'm glad, therefore, to take this opportunity to say now those who want to form their small parties are most welcome, provided they know that we want peace in Zambia, peace, stability, unity, and development. This fellow is signing on behalf of eight and a half million Zambians. Date of ascent is 17th December 1990. International observers, no problem, no problem. Uh, the only thing is that 
We said, let them come from anywhere, from any quarter, including Mars. Let them come. Kenneth Kaunda, one of the best-known African leaders, lost hopelessly in the country's first elections in 27 years. The wave of democracy that's gradually moving across Africa hit Zambia last week and swept Frederick Chiluba into power. Chiluba promises to end Kaunda's version of socialism and bring in free market policies and privatization. Last week, Kaunda was finally humbled as Zambia's three million voters gave a dramatic verdict against him. He polled just 20% of the votes, while the opposition candidate, Frederick Chiluba, of the Movement for Multiparty Democracy, the MMD, got the rest. Chiluba promises to end the nepotism and corruption that characterized the later years of Kaunda's rule and introduce free market policies to revive the crisis-ridden economy. Even after his party was banished into oblivion, Kumbla continued fighting to ensure that Zambians won back the freedom they had lost when they gained their independence in 1964. We have to remain grateful to him for the role that he played uh, post-independence uh, and uh, post soma declaration to continue to hold government accountable. Every government has to be held accountable. Otherwise, governments tend to get excited about the exercise of power and they begin committing excesses against citizens and you need people who can speak out against these excesses. And Mr. Nkumbula played that role uh, without fear of heaven. I think if we have to talk about the legacy of Harry Mwangangumbula, it is important that uh, we cherish his commitment to compare to multi-party politics. I think he lived throughout his life committed to that. I think it's also important in remembering Harin Kumbula to recognize that he was a very principled politician who did not waver in his convictions. He didn't believe that Kenneth Kaunda had the requisite leadership skills to run the country. And he didn't believe he could save his government. Even after repeated overtures to save in the UNIP government, he refused. Instead, he said, you can use my people. I don't want to be part of the government. That level of political conviction and principal nature is lacking in our politicians. But the old lion's health was failing. Uh, two days before Wamdala died, Wangilam Hospital, and it was my turn to go and see him. Um, I was very worried, I didn't know what to do. So, I went to see him, he looked up, and what he said to me, oh, kwashi ya kashimbi, tambaye kwashi ya mwe, ate, but menda sata kashimbi. I could see that the breathing was getting heavier and heavier. The nurse came and quickly, they called the doctor, and I was standing right there. Now, you may ask me, what was going through my, my mind. That was it. The old man died in my presence and I, I was holding his hand. So, for me, <clears throat> that was a blessing. 
a blessing which I'll never forget. And nobody will ever take it away from me. So, I saw him. I watched him go. And so, Zambia's greatest ever politician died on 8th of October 1983. An emissary from State House came and uh, he's, he asked me uh, f for authority to move the body to the ICU from the morgue because the head of state wanted to view it privately. And I said I had no objection. So they did that, but I was not anywhere near UTH when the head of state uh, viewed uh, late Harry's body. Another emissary came and said, President uh, says the state is taking over. Uh, Mr. Nkumbola would be given a state funeral. Of course, once that was done, all arrangements uh, we were making, we put on hold as a family. And uh, the body was flown by helicopter to Mala, where burial took place the following day. I really feel that the recognition of the role that Harry Kumbola played in building this nation called Zambia has been long overdue. I really pay gratitude to Nabuzoka for having taken the decision to give Harry Mwanga Kumbola his rightful place in the history of, of this country. I'm real touched that there's one group that has now decided to real tell the true story of who was Harry Mwanga Kumbola and what was his role in the foundation of the Zambian nation and its people. I would like Mr. Nkumbola to be remembered as someone who made a, an important contribution to the struggle for the independence of this country and to be remembered as such. I'm grateful to President Sata, late President Sata, may he so rest in peace, for naming one of our airports, which was Livingston Airport, Harimwanga Nkumbula International Airport. Much more needs to be done. His contribution must be reflected in the history books of Zambia, which our students, our pupils, must be able to learn in every corner of Zambia so that they know who Hari Mwangangumbula was. The current leaders in this country should honor Hari Mwangangumbula and his colleagues for the contribution they made to Zambia and Zambia's liberation. I think it's unfair to rewrite history and remove their names. And I, I think Sata, I thank Sata. I thank him. Let him, I thank him. Punishing vote to our mission was in the airport here, Livingstone. And I'm very happy, you know. At least he has remembered him.
he has remembered what he has done for this country. Honorary in Kumbula should not even be naming uh, one uh, airport. We need statues of Nkumbula, of Kapuepue, of, of Naomi we need, we need to build statues for these people. Our political regimes at the moment don't want any other politician to look bigger than them. History is not only what you write, history is what you see on daily basis. So we should immortalize Kumbula, immortalize Kapuepu, immortalize Namdia. In 2008, President Patrick Manawasa died in office. Three years later, in 2011, former President Frederick Chiloba died. And in 2014, President Michael Sata also died in office. They are all buried here in a place of honor in palatial shrines. But the father of the nation lies here under a shrub 336 kilometers away in a place few Zambians even know exists. He may be reviled and called all sorts of names in the rest of the country, but in the southern province, Harry Mwangankumbula is the hero who liberated not just the Tongas, but the whole nation from the shackles of colonialism. <laughs> Kumbula, Katira, Afria, Nigas. You are in Balubilo, Wagi, Chigolo, Njangan, Injinga, Njis, Njis, Jiam, Jiam, Jiam. Oh, what you tell me? You know, he was a very good father. We had good times. He was a very, very caring parent and always wanted the best for, you know, for his family. The indomitable freedom fighter made one final journey to his birthplace in Mala, the small village in the heartland of the southern province where it all started 100 years ago. As he once said, one carries one's principles to the grave. Here he lies probably Zambia's most principled politician ever, finally at peace, happy that the nation is at last free. May his soul rest in peace.